Welcome everybody to this seminar. So this seminar is the second of a series of seminars of uh, molecular biology, which is entitled uh, Fundamental Ideas on uh, Amazing Logic of Molecular Biology. And uh, we organize this series of seminars with Misha Gromov and François Kepes, uh, both present here. And uh, these seminars uh, are linked to a book uh, that we are currently writing with uh, Misha and François. And this book is about uh, uh, brilliant uh, ideas, breakthrough ideas uh, of molecular biology. Uh, and so the goal of these seminars is to present um, uh, interesting and outstanding topics of, mole of uh, molecular biology uh, to a general audience of scientists and then to, fav to favor uh, an interdisciplinary discussion after the seminar. So today uh, we are pleased to welcome uh, Annie Carel Bellan. Uh, Annie Carel Bellan is uh, emer Emeritus uh, Research Director at CNRS and she's working inside the uh, CEA Saclay. And she spent uh, years studying uh, epigenetic mechanism on uh, non-coding RNAs, uh, notably in uh, proliferation and differentiation equilibrium of cells. And she will present you today uh, open questions of epigenetics Good morning, everybody. <laughs> so I will try to tell you a little bit more about what is epigenetics first, and then uh, some of the, the open questions. Now, as you know, <coughs> I'm sure, uh, DNA, which is this long molecules uh, made of uh, bases, different bases, which form a sequence, is bearing uh, genetic information. Uh, how does it work? You have units in the DNA, which we call genes, and these genes are encoding, they are bearing the information for the biosynthesis of a protein. So each gene gives a given protein. Now, if you have modifications in one of the bases, you will have a corresponding modification in the protein. And sometimes this modification will give a mutant protein. The proteins participate to the cellular machineries, so they are very important for the cell biology. Now, this uh, pattern, this molecular pattern, uh, obeys to certain laws, which are called the, the Mendelian transmission laws, and which all together forms the genetics, analysis of the genes. For example, you have here the Mendelian transmission of a recessive character. So both parents have a normal phenotype, a perfectly normal phenotype, but they are bearing a mutation. Why? Because we have two chromosomes for each of our genes. We have two copies of each of our genes, one for the father, one for the, from the mother. And in this particular case, to be a mutant, to have a mutant phenotype, you need to have both copies mutated, okay? So here the parents, they are normal, but yet they have one mutant copy. So that their children will be of different phenotypes, either normal, with a normal genotype, or normal with a half mutant, if you wish, uh, genotype or affected if they receive the two uh, mutant uh, copies, okay? So what I'm going to is that genetics laws allow the same phenotype with different genotypes, as in this case here, different genotype with the same phenotype, but genetics does not predict different phenotype with the same genotype. Because if you have a mutation in the gene, then you will have the mutation in the protein. There's no. However, it's been known for very long, actually, that there are many cases of identical genotype and different phenotypes. And I will give you a few examples. For example, uh, the example of the bees. In, in, in the bee society, as you know, I'm sure, there is the queen and the workers. <coughs> Actually, the queen and the worker are all generated from the same larvae. 
a larvae can become either a queen or a worker. But the worker and the queen have very different phenotypes. Not only in the appearance, the queen, for example, is much bigger, uh, it has a different uh, appearance, but also in the function, because the queen, for example, has uh, active ovaries, whereas the worker does not. So it's a completely different phenotype with exactly the same genotype. Another example is closer to us, it's human. Here you have homozygous twins, so they are, uh, they are real twins, absolutely the same genotype. However, you might see that they have very different phenotype. This twin here suffers from the beckwith widowman syndrome, so is a giant baby. So again here, exactly the same genotype but different phenotype. And something which is, which is even closer no, to us. Mutation during, uh, during development. It does not. Ah. It does not. Yeah, it's an absolutely good yeah. point. It could be, but it's not. There's absolutely no mutation. Uh, another example which is even closer to us because it, it occurs in all of our organisms, each of us. It's this uh, very intriguing idea that all the cells from a complex organism, they come from a single cell. So this single cell will give her genotype or its genotype to all its descendant cells. So all the cells from the same organism have the same genotype. But as you may know, this uh, single cell will give rise during development to a very complex organism. No, no, it's an argument because genotype doesn't give you a phenotype, only give you an interaction with the environment. Right? It's a program of interaction. You change the environment, you can give you a phenotype. It, it also gives you a phenotype, but not but it is no, 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 it's not the only thing. It's two parameters. It's yeah. genes and exactly. all by definition of genotype, yeah. Exactly. So, but, but so the, the genotype the, participates, but it's not the it's the, a program. It's a program for development. Exactly. But previous example we were convincing, but not this one, because this a priori given the environment. They're supposed to have a different environment. Yes, but nevertheless, yeah. these cells, which are all very different from the brain, from the muscle, yeah. or from the gut. Yes. No, no, but they're exactly they have the same genotype. Of, okay. no, no, it's, of course, they, it means the same gen genotype. It's, when you say the same genotype, the same phenotype, meaning the same environment only. And if you forget it, it's just meaning, meaning for something. You know, but I'm, I'm over. Somebody has it, it's Misha, I'm genotype. just oversimplifying yeah. to make it more complicated no, 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 after. Logically, <laughs> I, 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 I can understand it, yeah. If you cut somebody to have the same genotype... Wait a like, second, oh. wait a second. Okay, no yeah. matter what yeah. the, the environment <laughs> is, these cells, they have the same genotype, they're different. It's actually the question, it's actually the question which uh, re led to the creation of the word epigenetics. It's this exact same question because uh, how the cells can have the same genotype but completely different uh, phenotype has been an intriguing question for decades. And actually, it was in uh, 1942 that uh, this guy, Conrad Waddington, proposed a model that he called the epigenetic landscape, and he created the word epigenetics for uh, the, the differentiation of the cell into different genotype, phenotype, with the same phenotype. So the idea is the following, you have the, the, the starting cell, the, the single cell, which gives rise to all the cells, and then this cell will uh, go down a hill toward an, a, a position of equilibrium. So it will come to here, and here you can see that the cell has two different paths that, he can, that it can goes, go to, and for example, it chooses this path, and acquires a certain degree of differentiation. And then it goes down again, and again it has two different possible paths, and again it will choose one and acquire another degree of differentiation. And depending on the way the cells uh, go to, they will have uh, different phenotypes. And for example, these cells which choose to go here and here, uh, will look like an epithelial cell, whereas this cell uh, uh, go, uh, looks like a lymphocyte, lymphocyte, for example. So that was the model which was absolutely non-linked to any molecular uh, mechanism. It was completely conceptual. 
this idea of uh, epigenetic landscape. Now there is now uh, a modern definition to epigenetics. So the, there are several actually. But let's say that the most current one is that it is the analysis of stable and reversible changes in gene expression that do not involve modification of genetic information. Now how does it work at the, at the molecular level? That's the, the way that we have done since 1942 and we know pretty much how it works at the molecular level. It's actually very simple. Okay, here is a cell. You can see that here are the cells, the cell muscles, the actin filaments. And here is the nucleus, the, the DNA is in blue. So in this uh, nucleus, <coughs> which is about 10 to, min to 10 minus, 16, minus 6 sorry, meters, so it's about 10 micrometer of diameter, you actually, in a human cell, so we're talking human cell, you have to pack two meters of DNA. That's what you have to put into this uh, very small uh, nucleus. So that means that the DNA cannot be naked. It has to be packed. It has to be compacted. <laughs> and <laughs> the way it is compacted is the following. So here is your naked DNA. And it's, it actually forms uh, little balls which uh, you can see at, uh, on the electronic microscopy, by, by electronic microscopy. So this is a, uh, these, these are these little balls. And these balls are made of DNA, which is wrapped around a core of proteins. So the proteins are called the histones. You have different types of histones. So the DNA is wrapped around the, the proteins and it, it, it's all together they form what is called a nucleosome and the whole thing is called chromatin. Excuse me, the histone that uh, is serving as the center of this mm -hmm. wrapped around DNA is not a part of DNA? No, no, it's, no. there are proteins it's, again. It's, it's yeah. completely different it's chemical. It's a foreign substance. Yeah, it's a foreign substance, okay? Uh -huh. There are proteins. There are among those proteins which are produced from the genes. Mm -hmm. No, but it does not, uh, so, so it's, 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 it's like... Uh, shelves of the library, not the books. Yeah, yeah there are books mm -hmm. in the shelves. Thank you. Okay, so... <coughs> the problem is that the compacted chromatin is not accessible for uh, cellular machineries. And if you want to express a gene, for a gene to be expressed, you need to have a machinery which binds to the DNA at the locus of the gene, okay, to the gene. So this machinery is the uh, mach DNA, uh, RNA polymerase machinery, so it's a whole protein complex, I'm not going to go into these details. But this uh, machinery binds to the DNA transcribe the DNA into what is called the messenger RNA. And as you, I, I'm sure you know, messenger RNA goes to the cytoplasm. It exits from the nucleus where the DNA is, <laughs> and it's translated into protein. So for gene to be expressed, you need to have access, free access to the DNA. So in fact, when chromatin is compacted, the gene is inactive. And when chromatin is open, then the gene is potentially active. It's only potentially active because for the gene to be active, you need more. You need the machinery to bind. It's a little bit more complicated than that. So you have different degrees of compaction. And the most compacted form of the chromatin is the, is the mitotic chromosome. So here, is a, a cell at the, at, at the final steps of its division. It's going to give two daughter cells. And what you see, so here is one cell, daughter cell, here is the other. What you see here are the chromosomes. All the chromosomes, they are very packed. 
very condensed. And at this point, uh, it's completely inactive. But even in between this step, in what, what is called the interphase nucleus, the DNA, the, the chromatin is not as compacted as in the chromosome, but it is that it still has different degrees of compaction. And you, you can distinguish euchromatin, what is called euchromatin, which is little compacted and in which you will find active genes, and heterochromatin, so this is an electronic microscope view of the, of the nucleus, heterochromatin, which is highly compacted and in which you will find inactive genes. So chromatin compaction is an important way of controlling gene expression. So chromatin compaction is itself controlled in a very stringent way for genes to be active at the right moment and the right place. So how is chromatin compaction controlled? It is controlled by chemical modifications of its components. So the components are DNA and proteins, the histones. So you can have modification of the DNA. So all these are very, uh, actually very small chemical groups which are added to the molecules, okay? Methyl is very small, etc. So DNA can be methylated and the enzyme, there are enzymes, of course, which are performing these uh, modifications, which are the DNA methyltransferases. Histones can have several modifications. The histone, actually, the, 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 the core histones of, of, this, uh, of this ball, they have tails that, that are protruding from outside of the ball. And these tails can be submitted to different modifications. They can be uh, methylated, they can be acetylated, they can be phosphorylated. And all those are mediated by enzymes, of course, the histone acetylases, the acetylases, histone methyltransferases, or kinases. And you have specific modifications of DNA and of histones, which are associated with compacted chromatin, and specific modifications, which are associated with open chromatin. So if we go back to our view of the nucleus by electronic microscopy, the compacted chromatin, in the compacted chromatin, you will find methylated DNA, deacetylated histones, and histones that are methylated on specific residues of these tails, like H3K9 or H3K27. It's not really important, but there are very specific residues, okay? Whereas in the euchromatin, with active genes, you have demethylated DNA, histones are acetylated, and they are methylated, but on different residues, like H3K4. So these, which are called the histone, the, the epigenetic marks, actually control the compaction of the chromatin. Now you can monitor these modifications at the level of the genome. So genome-wide analysis of the modifications. And you have uh, an example here of this region here, for example, uh, where you can see it's not really important what is here, but you can see that this mark here is deposited here, but this mark here is not, whereas here you had this mark, but not this one. This one is actually linked to active chromatin, and this one is linked to inactive chromatin. So you can see that, you have, that, that they are uh, mutually exclusive. You have either active or inactive chromatin. Now, if you do that at the genome-wide level, then you can establish what is called the epigenome. So the epigenome is the profiling, the, the pattern of modifications of the genome in a specific cell. It is the epigenome of the cell. So if the genome is a book, then the epigenetic marks open the pages or close the pages. Due to these epigenetic marks, 
you have pages that can be read and pages that cannot be read. Now, if we come back to this original question, which was at the origin of the word epigenetics, in the different cells, sorry, of the organism, which are so different with the same gene genotype and accordingly different, I agree, uh, um, environment. What is going on is actually the following. At the beginning, you have the cell, which has a certain pattern of genes which are highly compacted and inactive. And then, when the cells differentiate, and arrive to its uh, equilibrium states, this pattern of uh, inhibited genes has changed. More genes are blocked and other genes are active. So that what is actually um, making the difference between a, a cell and another cell is its epigenome. They have the same genome, but they have different epigenome. And all this is due to the epigenetic marks. So all that appears as very simple, no problem, everything is solved. However, there are uh, still some open questions, of course. Now the, qu the first question is, can epigeno epigenome be modified by external signals? So it's the relationship between uh, uh, gene expression generally and the environment. So this is a, a, a very interesting basic question but it also has a very important uh, uh, social consequences because of course it includes the relationship between the genome and the environment. Well actually the answer is yes. External signals are able to modify the epigenome. And for example, we can do that actually in vitro with cells that we have in tube, in test tubes. So how does it work? Well, you have an external signal which will hit the cell. This is an example of, of the way it can work through a, a receptor. And it will activate this receptor. And this receptor will activate a transduction pathway or chain of events that will uh, uh, um, activate each other up to the nucleus and to specific loci in the chromatin. So it's not going to be anywhere in any place. It's specific loci in the chromatin that will turn them from compacted, repressed mm -hmm. to uh, open and active. So yes, external signals can modify the epigenome. And if we come back to the, the B example, what actually makes the difference between the worker and the queen from the same larvae is its feeding. Because the queen is fed with royal nectar, whereas the workers are fed with something else. And we know that feeding the larvae with royal nectar actually modifies the epigenome of the bee. In the absence of uh, royal nectar, a subset of genes which products control the size, the other reactivity, etc., or everything which makes the difference between the worker and the queen, are methylated. And so you get a worker. Whereas royal nectar will demethylate this subset of genes, which then will be open, active, and you will get a queen. What is royal nectar? How is it produced? That's something I'm not a. <laughs> I mean, epigenetics, but. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a. It's a, it's a, it's a yeah, it's, it's, it's different. It's a. Yeah. It's a different food. It's different food. Yeah, yeah. It's by glucose and fat. So they have more food uh, pro and more proteins. So mm -hmm. they have, like bodybuilders, they have more oh. inclusive uh, feed. Thank you very much. Yeah.
So, but I said the proof that with simply feeding an individual differently, you can modify its epigenome and you can modify its phenotype. Well, you know, which has you eat more and you can get your phenotype, yeah. Sure. <laughs> sure, but it's not so only that. <laughs> Misha, it's not only that. Because, no, it means that uh, not only you get fatter, but maybe if you eat certain type of yeah. food, you will get certain diseases, and if you get, etc. So, I mean, it, it, it has really uh, very important implications for, uh, for the society. Now you have uh, uh, other examples, of course, you have many examples of that. Uh, one one uh, interesting example is uh, the, the, the stressing of a mouse, a pregnant mouse. So stressing the mouse means that you take the mouse out of its uh, box and you put, put the mouse alone for 15 minutes and then back and you do that at any hour in the day, etc. The mouse is stressed, the pregnant mouse is stressed. And what happened is that uh, the mouse, uh, mice born from a mother that was stressed during pre pregnancy is stressed itself. Whereas a mouse born from a well-treated mother is not stressed. And <coughs> it has been proven that it modifies the epigenome. <coughs> there is a gene which is called GAD. So I'm not a neurologist as well, so don't ask me too many questions about GAD. <laughs> but uh, <coughs> this gene, GAD, uh, it's an enzyme. It's expressed in neurons, and it is downregulated in psychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia, for example. And this gene is methylated in uh, mice which are born from a stressed mother and is not uh, methylated <coughs> in mice which are born from a well-treated mother. So it's another example on, of how external signals can modify the epigenome. So environment, nutrition, external conditions affect the epigenome. Now the most, I would say, important question is can epigenome modifications be transmitted to the next generation? And this, I have to say, is very controversial, and this is a very open question. It doesn't have a uh, complete answer, at least in mammals. In somatic cells, like if you uh, uh, culture a cell in vitro, you grow a cell in vitro. For example, a muscle cell, you grow a muscle cell, the muscle cell which remain a muscle cell. And if you grow an epithelial cell, the epithelial cell which remain an epithelial cell. So which means that when this cell divides into two daughter cells, the epigenome is transmitted to the two daughter cells. Even though, I remind you, that the chromosomes at some step of the division are completely fully condensed. So there is no more apparent uh, marks, different marks of the, ep of, of the uh, epigenetic marks along the DNA because everything is completely condensed. But nevertheless, the chromosomes or the cell keep an epigenetic memory because the daughter cells will have the same epigenome. Now, a more complicated question is, if you take an individual, is the epigenome transmitted to its descendants through the germ cells? So there are numerous studies in mouse and in human showing that you have transmission of certain phenotypes through, uh, and, and sometimes even epigenomes or epigenetic marks, through uh, to the descendants. And if we come back to the story of the stressed mice, not only uh, the, 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 the children of the, the stressed mice will be stressed, but the children of the children will also be stressed. Suggesting that the stressed mother has transmitted the epigenome to its descendant, 
and themselves have transmitted the to their descendants. Stage, what about the second? Because the egg cells of the development the, the yes, the exactly. Mother. So what about second yes. generation? Yes, and you have you can have uh, so it's it's not hundred percent. That's that's the the, the, the the very important thing with epigenetics is never hundred percent. Okay, but you have s some probability of the next generation. Yes, to the next generation. Uh, sir, could I ask very vague questions? Sure. Me? What's about stressed fathers? Uh, stress father, it, 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 uh, stress father has not been done in this ex particular experiment, but there are examples of transmission through the father. Okay. So it's a, it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so this suggests that maybe there is transmission of the epigenome, but it is very difficult actually to interpret because is the effect due to really molecular transmission? Like, okay, this place here was methylated and this was transmitted to the children. Or the epigenome, <coughs> is it due to cultural factors? The, 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 daughter, the, the mother is stressed, so he had, it has a certain behavior. It will learn this behavior to its children and then the children are stressed because they learned it from their mother and they will transmit that to their own children. And this, of course, you cannot sort out in these experiments. And moreover, and it's why there are uh, many epigeneticists are against the idea that there is transmission, epigenetic transmission of uh, character in mammals. It's because during development, the, the marks, these epigenetic marks, which make the chromatin open or closed or compacted or non-compacted, are completely or almost completely erased. And so here is the egg, the, the sperm, and then here's the, the fertilized egg, and then the, 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 the embryo start, embryogenesis starts, and at a specific stage, which is the blastocyst stage, the most important stage actually, because it's the formation of the embryonic stem cells, the inner mass of the embryonic stem cells, which are going to become the embryo. At this stage, the epigenetic marks, so here is the, the DNA methylation, are almost completely erased. And then they are gained again. So how can you transmit something if you erase everything? So many of the epigeneticists say, at least in mammals, there is no transmission no epigenetic transmission. However, you can ask the question, are epigenetic marks the only players in this story? Or are there other players involved? Okay, the epigenetic marks are erased, but maybe something else is keeping the memory. And this something might be uh, non-coding RNAs. So what are non-coding RNAs? They are transcribed from the non-coding genome this was previously called the junk DNA. But now it's more currently known as the dark genome or the dark side of the genome. The first thing that you have to realize, and that has been known also for years and decades, is that the complexity of organisms is not correlated with the number of genes. It's not as many genes you have, as many complex you are. It's completely different of that, actually. If you compare E. coli, which is a, a bacteria, very simple bacteria, no nucleus, single cell organism, it has about 4,000 genes. And if you compare that to human, much more complex, you have to admit, it's only six or more genes. So it, it does not really reflect. And if you compare, for example, this small worm here, C. elegans, so C. elegans is here, it's actually a very, very small organism with very little cells, so little cells that it's, it's used to analyze the development because you can follow cell by cell. It's very small, a little animal. Well, this uh, C. elegans has actually as many genes, or almost as many genes, as human. So clearly, 
the complexity does not follow the number of genes. No, no, wait, 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 because it's the way you interpret complexity, the human point of view of complexity, you know, the cornea, they were more complex than human. So sure, no, but complexity in terms of how many different type of objects you have in your organism, okay? The bacteria has very little, and we have many. And C. elegans has, not, has very little too, you know, and we have many. But we have, you know, so genes do not reflect the number of objects, of different objects that we have. That's the idea of complexity here, okay? Now, I mean, if you take how humans... How many cell types? Say, more specifically, how many cell types? How many cell types? How many, how many cell types? Not only cell types, yeah. but how many signals can we exchange how, in the, uh, from these cell types? Uh, how much these cell types can transform say, in one, one in each other? In general, mammals will be more complicated than insects, you know? Sorry? The insects, yeah. they're less complicated than mammals? Yeah, they are. And they're, they're almost... Uh, the, 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 the fly has, uh, I think... Uh, if I remember properly, something like uh, 10, 10 or 15,000 genes, yeah. or uh, almost as many. So that's so the... When you have, uh, on that plants, you have often, very often more genes, yeah? Some plants. Yes, yeah, some plants. Uh, some plants have uh, actually much more genes right. than we, ha when we have. But, but probably we don't know what they do, what their complexity is. They just have potential, we just we don't, we don't see it, because well, we see from the wrong angle. We don't know where to look at. Look maybe, yeah. maybe. But, but, yeah. but clearly, the... the um, Maybe I should go back to this one, actually. Uh, <clears throat> the complexity is almost uh, directly correlated to the, 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 the size of the non-coding genome, which is that means that the difference, if I even go back a little bit, sorry. Uh, the, the E. coli, if we compare E. coli and the human, E. coli is 90% coding, very little non-coding. Whereas human is 3% coding. Only 3% of our genome is encoding proteins. 97% is not. So if we, uh, for example, depict a chromosome by this ball of wool, in this whole ball of wool, the coding part is here. It's the only here. Everything else is non-coding. So all the genetics that we have studied up to now was only on 3% of our genome. Do you know what the other 97% do? Wait a second. <laughs> well, I, they, they, I, I don't have all the answers here because it, it is, uh, but I, I will tell you. So 3% and 97% is uh, non-coding. But it's been called junk DNA for years and years. Nobody knew what it was uh, useful for. The discovery, the, the more recent, I mean 20 years ago, discovery of, of small non-coding RNAs actually triggered the interest uh, for the non-coding genome. What are they? Uh, these uh, small RNAs are actually very, very short RNA sequences, about 25 nucleotides in length, whereas uh, a messenger RNA is uh, around 1,000 to 2,000 nucleotides, so they're very small. They have been discovered in, the, in this swarm, actually, C. elegans, but uh, they are ubiquitous, <coughs> almost ubiquitous. And what they do is that they bind to messenger RNA, and uh, through, uh, by guiding a complex of proteins, they are inhibiting protein expression. So they are controlling gene expression. So it's another layer of control for gene expression. But, Small non-coding RNAs, of course, represent a very small part of the non-coding genome. They are very small, and there are about seven thousands of them, so it's a very small part of the non-coding genome. So what, what is the rest? Well, actually, uh, very recently, it has been shown using a, a, a new technology for sequencing, which is called new generation sequencing, that uh, almost all the genome is transcribed in RNA. Now, uh, I will not go into the detail of, of the technique, but the, the, the main idea is that you sequence molecule by molecule so that you are able to see molecules which are very little expressed in a population. You don't do, do the average of the whole population as we did before. Now, it's molecule by molecule. So if a molecule is 0.1%, if you have sufficient deep 
which means that you do sufficient, uh, a sufficient number of sequences, you will be able to see it. It will ask individually for each point in the yes. genome or on random, it's just statistically, you take samples. No, 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 you analyze molecule by molecule. Uh, on a, of course, uh, on a random, I mean, no, no. Okay, it's no, not no, the no, whole no, no, population. No, 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 but you sample and just pick up this non coding yeah. this non coding this non coding No, 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 give you good no, 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 no. You take the whole population, you put it on, and okay. as, of course, as many uh, molecules. No, no, wait, 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 but then you have billions of molecules, how can, no yes, you have billion, billion of sequences. Different, and you can yeah, tell yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you need, know, of course, a lot of bioinformatics yeah. and uh, all that, okay? But this uh, allowed to show that you have actually more than 70% of the genome, which is transcribed in RNA. So it's not uh, messenger RNA. Is so what is not transcribed? Uh, you have very repeated sequences, yeah. you know, highly repeated, yes. which are uh, almost uh, uh, compact all the time. Uh, and they're not compact. So that, yeah, okay. so they are transcribed from time to time, but uh, but very very little. So it might be, yeah. So these non-encoding non RNAs, what what do they do? Well, they do uh, to answer your question. They do actually a lot of things. They bind to RN to proteins and they uh, modify the expression of the genes by binding to proteins. Uh, they uh, absorb out other molecules like the small RNAs, for example, and then like, like they control. Uh, but they are also able to modify the epigenome, and it's been known for a long time. Again, for that this uh, th there are examples of that that have been known for a long time. For example, uh, this non-coding RNA exists. It's a very long non-coding RNA, huge non-coding RNA. It covers one of the X chromosomes in somatic cells of mammalian females. As you know, uh, mammalian females have an XX, and you need to inactivate one of the two to have uh, uh, the good expression of the genes, of some of the genes at least, which are on the X chromosome. So one of the X is silence, and this silencing involved a long non-coding RNA, which is called ZIST. This long non-coding RNA actually covers entirely one of the two X chromosomes. So that's so huge, yeah? It's, it's a very big, but it's a, 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 a no, no, it's a molecules. All, all, all different molecules are covering, you know, I by the, I I but it's a very big, it's very big RNA. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, like what, and like that, it silences this uh, chromosome. So it's known that non-coding RNAs are actually uh, modifying gene expression and the epigenome. So it is very likely to me, but it's not been demonstrated yet, that in <coughs> this cell in which all the epigenetic marks have been erased, in the cytoplasm of these cells, there are long non-coding RNAs which are keeping the memory of the epigenome, and like that, which but will be able to what, transmit. What, what happened to them? In what form they keep the memory? Because the sequence that they are represent, the, the, merely yeah. by their sequences, but because they, 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 you, you can imagine that you have, it's, it's all speculation, okay? Yeah. But you can imagine that the cytoplasm, you have long encoding RNAs bound to certain uh, epigenetic markers. For example, uh, you have long, long, certain sequences of long encoding and RNA are bound to then, methyl transferases. And marking the CPEs, RNA is still there. Yeah, RNA is still in there. And form, then. In what form do they remember? What is in code the memory? I, I, okay. It's like let, structure. Let me try to. Okay, you have this part here. No, let's say. Or this part here, the, which needs to be methylated, okay? You have an RNA which corresponds to this sequence which is bound to a methyl transferase. It's in the cytoplasm, so nothing happens. But then, at some point, it reaches the nucleus after the erasement, okay? Ah, so it reaches the nucleus. So this enzyme will do it. And yeah, it's exactly, RNA. exactly. The RNA will guide the enzyme. It's yes. speculation, pure okay. speculation, okay? But the, the RNA will guide the enzyme to this specific locus, which will be methylated. So the, 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 you, you really can imagine. And, and in, it's, it's been shown, for example, that in the paramecia, Paramecium, a completely different uh, uh, way of doing things. Because the paramecium has two nuclei, a micronuclei and a, a macronuclei. Actually, the micronuclei has all the genome information, but in a highly compacted form. So it's very small. The macronuclei has lost all the unused genetic information for the somatic cell, okay? 
So it's, it's big because it's transcribed, so you have all the transcribing machineries, etc. but it's smaller, the genome is smaller. And so you have to, the, the paramecium has to have very, very stringent way of controlling what is deleted in the DNA and what is not, okay? And what, what is doing that is non-coding RNAs. It's RNAs which is selecting the part of the genome which is deleted in the macronutrients. And how big is the, that genome in paramecium? That I don't remember, I, that I don't remember. But I mean, it's, 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 it's and he, this is demonstrated, it's non-coding RNA. So I, I'm almost sure that in this case here, it can happen, okay? So if we have the molecular basis. Because you have because, because muffler that just deadens the certain, 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 uh, certain place in the in the cytoplasm? Yes. Yeah. And then when it, when it go, goes someplace, it keeps well, the imprint of what, what yeah. it's been muffling. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. And how, in principle, how is it going to be defined? What type of experiment you can imagine? Well, you have to take the cytoplasm of the, the cell at this stage, for example, of one of the embryo. cells, and yeah, in, injected uh, uh, the, the nucleus of the one cell into the cytoplasm. Of one. It's a complicated <laughs> experiment, okay? It's not a very simple experiment yes. to do, but I'm almost sure it's, uh, it's worth doing it. So, that. <laughs> what? <laughs> I will review this with, the, with this uh, hypothesis. <laughs> And thank you for your attention. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I thought it was going to be longer. <laughs> I thought there would be more questions. So I wouldn't want to have but too many slides. Yeah, but please, what are the possibilities of experiment? They may be not so direct experiment, but it says about some giving these indications, right? There might be some visible effect. You can do something and see some reaction depending whether it's there or not. For example, you may try to disturb this connection and see if it affects or not, not affect particular, particular phenotype. Well, the problem is, is all that is sequence specific, of course. So you need to affect, if you want to affect something, you need to affect Certainly. specifically this sequence. Well, but you can so inject another RNA of, of, of this sequence, a complementary RNA or something, I guess. I, I, again, I, I think what you can do, what I would think of doing, okay, is taking the, the cytoplasm of the cell and putting it to, to the, for example, uh, I don't know, some uh, different epigenomic, uh, clear different epigenomic, uh, in, uh, for example, in mouse, they are very uh, obvious uh, character. And you, you, you take the cytoplasm of the cell, you put it to the, with the nucleus of the, and other cells, or you replace the nucleus. And then you see if uh, you get your uh, character of which uh, yeah, person. Yeah, and yeah. then, and then what you do is you treat this, if, if it's positive, if you get your, then you treat that with RNAs to make sure you, you kill yeah. all the RNA right. and you show that yeah. it's RNA dependent. And then what you do, if it is yes. the truth, then you take the RNA and you si sequence the mm -hmm. RNA and see if it corresponds to uh, but my scan is we can modify a genome on the junk part. Yeah. And so you take it, you change all the dark part, big chunk of this and modify it. So can you observe the phenotypical differences? The, the rest of the genome, you yeah, mean? Yeah, take part of the genome, which is yeah. not, not, not coding. And then you modify it. You modify it and see what happens. Well. How much it? We don't know. We don't know at this point. There is not enough uh, um, um, studies to, to to know exactly uh, which part of the genome is important for this and which is not. Because you still might have in this, uh, uh, in this yeah. transcribed genome parts which are not important of specifically this uh, uh, process of, of transmitting, okay? Because long encoding RNAs might have also completely different functions. So is it, at this point, it's different to, to say, I'm going to modify the genome. Uh, and, uh, and returning to one of the examples you're showing of these two, two identical twins, so what, what exactly could cause this disease? I have no, no idea. It's, a, it's an epigenetic disease. It's, 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 what, what, it's what happens? A, what kind of it's a, 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 the, the, this one is, is, is rather complicated. Yeah. This one is, is rather complicated, and I, th I don't think it's, it's completely clear how uh -huh. it happens, uh -huh. okay? 
there are other epigenetic diseases in which it's, it's, it's more clear, uh, in which, for example, these, uh, these, um, these uh, uh, enzymes which are modifying the chromatin are, are uh, mutated like the red syndrome the red syndrome is a, is also a, a syndrome of this, of this type mm -hmm. and actually it's a dna methyltransferase which is mutated so it's a genetic epigenetic disease the other one is that the beckman uh, is is, yeah. is purely epigenetics which is much more complicated to analyze but it's the case was known yeah the yeah yeah it's known it's absolutely known. So, yeah, I wonder what you think about the uh, So, we have the, the Queen B or the King B, I don't know, or ACGT. So, we call this, I mean, any mutation in an A or a C or a G or a T to change to one other letter of four is called a genetic mutation, not an epigenetic mutation. The rest is epigenetic. It should we be so absolute about this distinction? For instance, you mentioned the methylation on the cytosines, not on the protein histone, on the cytosine. Okay, methylated cytosine is not C anymore. It's a different thing, chemically speaking. It looks a little more like one of the three others, actually. And so the fact that it has been methylated induces mutations, genetic mutations. Mm, it depends on what you call genetic mutation. Because if you call genetic yeah, mutation yeah. something which affects uh, the, the, the phenotype of the protein product, then methylation of, uh, of the cytosine is not sure, a sure, genetic no, mutation. No, okay? So the genetic mutation is... Because it affects the protein, anything... I, I would say maybe anything which would affect the structure of the yeah, protein. So no, no, of course it doesn't affect the protein mm -hmm. uh, sequence in the specific case of the methylated cytosine. Can it affect protein quantity? Huh? It might affect protein quantity. It will affect, oh, okay. it will affect protein quantity, but it will not affect the, the structure yes. of the protein. But, but not only that, but it can also be changed to another letter. Why is it? Because it looks a little, yeah. it's yeah. ambiguous, it's not really yeah. a C. Right. So, so then, what is the limit to say, should, should we be so absolute, is my question, so should we be so absolute about distinguishing genetic mutations and epigenetic mutations in the sense that there are seven categories of epigenetic mutations from very close to the DNA, chemically speaking, to very far away, and that some of the genetic, uh, some of the epigenetic marks, sorry, are actually uh, making more probable genetic mutations in the proper sense of the Well, so I think, yeah, I think that your question comes to what is a gene, actually. If a gene is a, a unit of DNA which uh, encodes a protein, then you, you restrict uh, a mutation to what changes the protein. But now, more and more people are, have a tendency to call a gene what is expressed, actually. And long non-coding RNAs are also expressed from genes. And then, if you, if you, if you, if you change this, uh, this uh, definition, then the dis distinction between epigenetic and genetic is not that easy to make, because let's say that our, uh, I said my hypothesis is, is correct, that uh, uh, epigenetic marks can be transmitted through RNA, then RNA is encoded in a gene. So it's also a genetic uh, process. <laughs> well, but now you can, unit information is described is a RNA bound to a particular protein. Yeah. That's the unit information. Well, no. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, let's say, yeah. yeah. RNA but is bound to unit, a different kind of unit Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this unit, unlike, it's, it's a fundamental difference. It's not kind of binary code. It's really kind of yes or no. It's very primitive in a way, the system, right? It's not, there's no spatial organization. So you can't no. code too much with it, yeah. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for us, some of the genetic information, if you think of the most type, the type which is most remote from the DNA, could actually go outside the cell. You could have. Like the, actually, the first example of an epigenetic effect was, was discovered in the 1950s on bacteria. And it involves, as we now understand it, involves uh, the expression of a certain gene, actually the, the lactose uh, 
permeates, which go to the membrane and forms the lactose. And, uh, and it was transmissible because actually they looked for more than 30 generations, right? And they, they, they stayed, they had two populations based on the difference of a few minutes that they induced the lactose permeates or not. The bacteria so really different with the somatic, isn't it? You can share with somatic and Sure, sure. I'm not talking about an organism here, about the isolated cells, that's right. Yeah. And um, so the lactose permeates the membrane as part of the loop mm -hmm. of the uh, epigenetic loop that uh, can be either on or off globally. And uh, the, uh, the substrate actually is outside the cell. It's small thing. So you have the actors of this epigenetic switch are uh, sugar, which is outside the cell, a protein uh, pump, which is at the membrane or the envelope of the cell, and also the, the DNA, the um, messenger RNA, and everything that is ne necessary to to uh, express the, the lactose permeates. So it's a complex loop that goes even outside the cell, and that uh, and actually was the first, at least that I know of, is the first example of an epigenetic switch. Was this one. So. It, it can really be very remote from the DNA somewhere. Sure. And, uh, and uh, if you go like that, I mean, any change in gene expression is, uh, is linked to at least epigenetic mechanisms. Any induced gene or any repressed gene is accompanied by changes. I mean, it's exactly like for the, the, the lactose story, you know. You have a, a, an epigenetic yeah. switch, so, and it's why actually epigenetics is, uh, the definition of epigenetics is, is, is starting to be very vague, because it's, it's a, It has to be a switch, but also it has to be transmissible to the, uh, to the progeny. Right? Yeah. And so maybe, yeah, but, maybe but it's, the same, it's the same molecular mechanisms which are used. It's often, it's so, so gene expression actually, uh, regulation of gene expression is actually using epigenetic mechanisms, yeah. I would say. Yeah. What is the problem with genome? Because I think it's not so stable as genome. So what can we rename genome? What do you mean? It's not. Oh. The, the genome is not stable? That's no, what you I mean. I mean the, the epigenome. Uh, oh, the epigenome. The epigenome. Well, it, 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 if it's transmitted, it's stable. If it's transmitted, it can be stable. It can, it can, can be stable uh, in the generations. That's the whole story, you know. But, uh, but it, it is also unstable, of course. And it's why it's, it's reversible. It's in the definition. That the definition that I, I told you, it's, it's a non-genetic, with no modification of DNA, uh, um, transmission of a character which is stable but reversible. And why reversible? Yeah, it's... Why? No, why? Sure why? why? Because the, the, the epigenetic marks are reversible. All of them are reversible. They can be well, reversed. Not, and it's actually what happens no, when no, you... No, when you logic, because you see, you can reverse one, you take away a letter. From DNA, you can't put it back. You don't know where to put it back yeah. because it's, it's partially given ap 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 apostatic. Mm -hmm. But if you have mm -hmm. some protein bound to somebody, you can go back and forth. Yeah, which is, is not the case. It's mathematical point. It's, it's actually, actually it actually always go back and forth. Yeah, it's mathematical point which mathematics is not going to realize. Like, that number ten, one zero, that 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 ten, they give that number. Yeah. But it's and the reversibility is for the sure. Yeah. It's for sure reversible. <laughs> no, it's for sure reversible. It's been proven because if you, you take a fully differentiated cell and with some trick, you can re reverse it to uh, 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 fully totipotent cells with completely different epigenome. Yes, very easy. Everyone can do that in, in a lab. You introduce a cocktail of, of genes, which are the potency genes, I would say. We were just talking about that. Yeah. <laughs> and then in a certain percent of the cells, not the whole population, but in a certain percent of the cells, you get embryonic stem cells or what looks like 
uh, real embryonic stem cells. So it's reversible. I, I need two questions. One very practical. You show two identical twins. Yeah. And then one has syndrome and has the other. What exactly happened there? That's the question again. I mean, the, the question was asked already, and I think for this particular syndrome, it's not known very well. Certainly, because the... the, 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 the how common it's in general, if how common it for twins? How common? I, oh, it's not common. It's, a, it's not very common. But, uh, but for twins, it happened only once. This happened once in hysteria. For example, the only one in hysteria. Oh, no, 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 there are several. It's, 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 an, it's a well-known syndrome, but it's no, a rare, no, no. rare syndrome. Which happens to the, to the identical twins. Ah, what happens, the, the well, event? No, if this phenomenon, having this syndrome in one of the twins, happens on the observed, on recorded only once. If you record yeah. only once, you will be suspicious about uh, that. No, 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 it's not only once, again. I mean, it's, well, there have been several cases. Twins, oh, know. yeah, identical yeah. twins. Specifically this part of, part of the syndrome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because identical twins, how often this happens, by the way? One out of I, I think it's a rare syndrome. No, no, how many identical twins are Ah, there? how many identical twins many you have? In that? So that's the question I cannot answer. Yeah, but in see statistically, it may be correlation being identical twins having this syndrome, whatever mm -hmm. change mm -hmm. you No, no, it's a rare case, that's for sure. It's no, not frequent. It's a statistic, yeah. So if you have one out of 10,000, 10,000 of identical twins, and one out of 10,000 of the syndrome, and then you have 10 of them observed, it's one story. So the one observed, it it's not one. That's for sure. It's not one. But, but I cannot. I cannot. But you have to know this number. To see tell you the, the exact number, but it's not one. Because okay. Exactly. At the mm -hmm. moment when you have identical twins, there's different division, and there may be yeah, some yeah. anomaly mm -hmm. happening at this time. Yeah. Can you say the syndrome again? So Beckwith. Beckwith Whitman. Beckwith Whitman. But but again, oh, we know some mark that in this case is two identical twins. You have some uh, epigenetic yeah. Terms you can you can terms of you can imagine. I I I don't think it's you been it's been done. Yeah, but you can imagine that the, this uh, the, the the twin is giant. So you can imagine that something is going wrong with the uh, IGF and all these uh, <coughs> genes involved in in uh, the size of the body. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, they are demethylated when they should be methylated. You know, you or, or, or the imprinting is, is. It was not investigated. What exactly? No, I don't think so. Okay. How do you know there were no mutation, by the way? Yeah? I don't think they sequence. Well, you can, yeah, you can sequence the well, whole genome, uh, but, but, no, no, but, uh, but I guess what has been done, what has been done is sequencing all the, the genes that are known uh, responsible. Yeah, to be responsible for the size of the body, and they didn't find any mutation. And when this was what which year, this example we brought up? Oh, I think, why, well, it's last, uh, last century, I think, the discovery of this syndrome. No, the end of the last century, maybe, maybe uh, 1980 or something the like that. The sequence was good enough at that time. So no. Of course, you cannot rule out, because you, you never can sequence completely the whole genome, okay? Because you have all these repeated sequences and all this stuff. So you cannot rule out definitely that there is no mutation. But as much as you know, uh, there is no mutation in uh, all the genes which are involved in the body size. That's so, uh, it's kind of question. There are two, two reasons why epigenetics exists. One reason is to reflect the, the environment changing, and this type of epigenetic, I think, shouldn't be inherited because otherwise they lose this. Well, it, it, it can be inherited. There, there are studies like that in human where people have been starved and their grandchildren still have some uh, problems with, uh, with uh, uh, feeding problem, behavior, you know. So, it, and it's supposed to be inherited. But the same, the, the, the same problem, as I mentioned, for the mice it holds there because the, the grandfather who was uh, uh, starved, uh, 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 has a certain behavior with food that it can transmit to, to his children and they, they will transmit to their grand to their children. So it's, it's complicated. But. but the second type of epigenetic, it's when it's really inherited, but uh, that actually control of the gene expression that uh, repeatable from the generation to generation. But uh, this type of epigenetic, to my mind, they sooner or later come to, on the genetic level. Because even expression level of RNA should be, or even that uh, enzyme that modified, 
they also controlled by the by the genes. So these yes, the RNA. As I as I said, you know, the RNA. Let's say that non-coding RNAs are involved in there. Non-coding RNAs are. Mm -hmm. Are transcribed by the DNA from the DNA. Okay, so <laughs> they are they are sort of genes. Yes, of course. This is the function is to epigenetic, but they still yeah, sure. control Absolutely. the genetic code. Absolutely. And this type of epigenetic inheritance, because. But both types, the, both, the two types you mentioned, can be inherited again because even what is from the external uh, uh, from external signal can also be uh, transmitted. But when you say the most of this genome is being transcribed, yeah, right. so there might be some promoters somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. It's, it's the same RNA polymerase that uh, that transcribes. Uh, no, but these promoters, well, but this, these promoters, the same is uh, we are being able to activate genes, yeah? Yeah. And the same promoters you find everywhere. More, more or less, more or less, more or less. It's not completely known yeah. yet because, uh, you know, it, it is probably, so... Lower fidelity, yeah, probably five is not so often. Well, actually, you know, uh, we are under the idea that the non coding genome is not conserved because it's non coding. You know, that's the genetic right. view of the genome. It's not correct. Uh, if you take the difference between mouse and human uh, and you take everything which is conserved, 20% is coding, but 80% is non coding. So, from everything which is conserved between mice and human, 80% is non coding. Some some of the non-coding genome is also concerned, so it's not. But some, we say, it's like pseudo genes, yeah, they're not usually they change, yeah. But yeah, pseudo genes because pseudo genes they had their counterpart, their normal yeah. counterpart, okay. But the, the non-coding genes mm -hmm. might uh, they, they, there is some pressure on them because some of them do not have their counterpart and they are useful mm -hmm. with this specific sequence. And so they are rather concerned. Part of part of the, of the non-coding genome is strong, is conserved, contrary to what. Okay, but that's interesting. You can identify the parts which you can search. Yeah, yeah, sure, you can. And this yeah. sh should be the part which is. Uh... And again, you know, we say, okay, we compare the mouse and the human, and everything which is non consumed is useless. But there are some differences between mouse and human. <laughs> yeah. And this difference might reflect, have to reflect somewhere yeah. in the genome because. So everything which is non consumed between mouse and human doesn't mean that it's not use useful, okay? Might be useful, but for the differences. I have a question because you, you tell that during development at the blastocyst stage, uh, almost all epigenetic marks are erased, right. but still uh, there are some of them yeah. which persist. And yes. Do we know if they have a role in epigenetic tra transmission and if some genes are maybe selected? Of course, you can, you can imagine that, you know, these very small parts of the, of the, of the marks which is conserved. Uh, are the ones which are maintaining the memories because of they are controlling some specific genes which are blah, blah, blah. You cannot rule this out, of course. Okay. Mm. So I'm curious, what was the definition of epigenetics by Biden? If you if if had any. Yeah. Well, I don't think he, I, I don't remember, I think he had a very specific definition and it was something like a, a transmission of a character uh, which is uh, non-Mendelian or something like that. At this time, you know, it was Mendelian transmission okay. or non-Mendelian transmission. But I'm not sure. Any other question? So my impression is that in this field there is a lot of confusion due to this binary uh, duality between genetic and non-genetic or genetic. While uh, from what uh, you really described, uh, there is a kind of continuum of time scales of inheritance, and that, uh, let's say, genetic is the most uh, long time scale, while there is... Exactly. No, no, the structure is very different. The fundamental structure... The, the mechanism, the, the, the no, molecular... No, no, no specific mechanism, the whole logic is different. Yeah. And you say one is, depends on position of coding. And that's absolutely fundamental. It's absolutely different from anything else. Mm -hmm. right. It's very different from anything else. So it's okay, can, can you form, form, formulate? Yeah, no, position coding. Yeah, yeah, like numbers in position coding and in non position coding. They're different numbers. Even mathematics, they're different numbers. So what does it mean on position coding? Because, well, because, 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 because well, the Roman, Roman, Roman system, Roman system of describing numbers. 
We were not positional. You just have to give name for every number, individual name. No, and, and here is position, and this is completely different carry, carrier information, incomparable. From N go to 2 to the N. They're incomparable. Not that they're different, incomparable, different worlds. So all this ep epigenesis is just tiny part of what can be done uh, genetically, because in one case you have two to the end possibilities, and here only n. n is a million. Hmm. So there's a million different possible Although epige ep epigenetic. There are two to the billion different genomes. But wait, uh, epigenome, epige what, you know. what we call the epigenome is also positional coding. I mean, this sequence Mi of yeah. That's it, but is, No, but I don't think it works by sequence. It's either yes or no. Well, some people... So, so, Misha, some, some people call the, an epigenetic no, code. Say, but, no, no but I don't think it's right. No I don't think it's right. There's no evidence for that. No, no, no. It's no. just block the gene. It's yes or no. Yeah. But the whole yeah. gene, not for the sequence. Mm. It's incomparable. Mm. You're saying a different exponential scale. It's by, by factor of trillion, billions mm. of trillions. Mm. Incomparable. The idea mm. is most important. Like your language and, and exclamation signs. Exclamation signs change, but it's not the same as the text. Yeah? It's like exclamation, commas, you know, punctuation signs. It's not the text. I agree. I agree. It's colors, colors on the. On the, on the I agree. And they're crucial. They may they change completely everything, but they still in, informational content may be small. The effect may be horrible, may be here. That's what it's, uh, it's because they go over, over, over this, this by the recording. But still, you have the same uh, vari variety of information, the same complexity of information in the non-coding RNAs, which, yes, well, which, which may have different absolute, functions. Absolute, absolute, absolute. Absolute. No so this, I, I, that's exactly yeah, this hmm. huge world of, of information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you have also used differently, not like in genes. Yeah, it's probably. Probably, but way. but it's I mean it, it's not clear. I mean we don't have the, the complete catalog of the way that they function. Okay, so we might have surprises there. You talk of the complexity as the number of different type of cells that you have in the organism. It's a very simple way of. Yeah. <laughs> one possible definition. Yeah. And on the other side, you talked of the ratio of non-coding versus coding uh, RNA, and. Um, it's not clear to me the link between the two of them. Well, what, what, what you can observe is that if you go from a very poorly complex organism to a very complex organism, the number of genes does not differ that much. Six, sixfold between the bacteria and human. But the non-coding um, length, the length of non-coding, because of, of course the person uh, it depends on the length, the total length, okay? So the total length of the non-coding genome is hugely different because it's, it's only 10% in the bacteria, it's 97% in the, in the, see what I mean? So for the almost the same number of genes, you have 100 times more non-coding in, in the human. So it's more or less, it's, of course, there is no measure of complexity, so there is not, it's not a, 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 a direct correlation, but it's more or less correlated with the length of the non-coding RNA, non-coding genome. But it's still not clear to me the relation between this uh, ratio and, uh, and, uh, and the number of different type of cells that would define the complexity. Well, the idea behind that is that uh, you have certain number of genes which are absolutely useful for uh, every cell, okay? So this is your... Uh, let's say 6,000 bacteria and humans. It's not the case, of course, because it's very different from bacteria and human, but just to make it very simple. And then you have, let's say, 20,000 genes, which are, uh, which are going to be different between different cells, okay? Uh, but these, all these genes, finally, that it's not so different. What makes the difference is this whole non-coding genome, and it's why I think that uh, it's not only controlling gene expression, but it might also have functions of its own, if you see what I mean, which there are very different between one cell and the other, and, and which we absolutely don't know of at this point. Okay? So it's, a, it's not, the genes might not be the whole story. And obviously, Although I have to say that this, with these uh, 24,000 genes, we actually, with, with splice variants, have much more proteins, much, much more proteins 
maybe, I don't know, maybe tenfold more. But still, it, it does not. It's an observation. We have no explanation for that. You mentioned that, uh, you mentioned the uh, example of induced neuron stem cells. Did you say that the yeah. can be reacted? Yeah. yeah. And I was wondering if there is a similar technique that allows to switch on and off genes, but it targets the dead of the genome precisely. So that directly by changing the, modifying the epigenome, not yet. Yeah, I think it's a very complicated uh, process, okay? So you have to really touch uh, various things, including maybe the non-coding genomes that we don't know about, okay? So, no, not yet. I have a question. Maybe you mentioned it in your talk, but concern the stressed uh, mass mm -hmm. that transmits uh, so the, the stress to uh, doctors, etc. Do you know what is the maximum of generation? Well, I, I think I, I think it's about three, four. Three, four. Yeah. Okay. And it's, again, it's not hundred percent penetrance. Huh? Okay. It's it's uh, not all the mice. Because when they observe the mice is stressed, yeah. yeah. I mean, now oh, there are ways to observe yeah, that a mass yeah, is yeah. stressed, yes. <clears throat> so there is this uh, idea of epigenetic drugs. What, what do we have on the market as epigenetic drugs? Well, you have uh, inhibitor of the histone deacetylases, of course, uh, that's uh, are the most uh, mm -hmm. used. But I think there are pipelines to get a lot of others, like uh, inhibitors of histone methyl transferases are uh, very fashionable, I think, at the moment. Um, yeah. It's, it's all in cancer field. Right? Yeah, in cancer, yeah. There are no epigenetic drugs for other diseases? Uh, for other diseases? Not that I know of. But I'm most familiar with the cancer field, and uh, <laughs> I, I'm not very familiar with the rest. So I can't. epigenetic drugs in the end, they just act on proliferation. Well, no, 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 no. You can have also you can induce differentiation. Hmm. Well, you, the problem with epigenetic drugs is that they hit every everything in the genome. So I mean, <laughs> it's not, it's not. I, I would say it's not the best future or the. How the mechanism uh, I mean, to self-regulate the epigenome itself that is uh, uh, do we know some mechanism that would say that is something like uh, methylation is controlled by some other kind of methylation? Is there a way yeah. to, is there a way not to go back to the DNA to, to have uh, to maintain the, uh, the well it's 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 uh, rather well known for acetylation of histones for example because you have histone acetyl transferases and histone deacetylases that are actually working on, on the genome all the time. So it's really a balance of having locally uh, less of one to have the, the histone acetylated or not. So it's really the, the whole thing is, is, a, is a question of recruiting the, 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 the factors and to maintain the, 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 the mark, you need to recruit the enzyme constantly, because otherwise you had the other guys who deacetylate. <laughs> well, that's, that's in euchromatin, okay? But uh, if you had uh, in, in, in the uh, constitutively condensed chromatin, I think that the, the marks are much more stable. As, as it is condensed, uh, it's like for everything else. I mean, it's inaccessible to the enzyme. So, this is really a new commodity. So, it's a system that is not totally detached from the DNA, but that might be studied in itself or not. It's not detached from DNA at all because it's it's on yes. DNA. It is not, but uh, there is some part that could be uh, that could be studied in itself. I mean, this uh, as soon as you may say that there is a regulation of, uh, of the epigenome itself, mm -hmm. uh, at some point it may be 
uh, not limit anymore. Uh, some part of this regulation may not be linked anymore to, to, to the DNA. It has to regulate itself. Oh, you mean, you mean that the enzymes are regu are re themselves are regulated? Well, it's again, I mean, it's, 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 it's really a matter of local because it, it can be very much acetylated here, but not acetylated at all, 100 kilobases uh, away from, from there, okay? So if you, if you regulate the enzyme, then you regulate everybody. So it's very local. So I don't think it's at the level. It's really at the level of the recruitment of the enzymes. Thank you. Thank you, Annick. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs>